Hey team plan strong. I hope you're all doing insanely well this time of the year. It seems like everyone is coming down with a cold and let's face it. The kids are back in school. They're coming home with germs. The shift in the weather makes you want to stay in bed a little bit longer and the nights are getting darker sooner and sooner. If you want to feed your family, with something that's gonna help beat those colds, I wanna make sure that you know about our soul warming, ready to eat chili stews and culinary broths. 99% of prepared soups and broths on the market have enough sodium to pickle your whole entire family. You know exactly what I'm talking about. At Plant Strong Foods, we trust that you have a salt shaker at home and we want you to be in control of how much sodium you put in your food. And if one of your loved ones has been hit with the seasonal flu or a nasty cold, there is no better gift than a sample bundle of our chilies and stews or our sippable broths. These are true comfort foods that are 100% whole food, plant strong, oil free, organic, and low in sodium. We made these just for you guys. Check them out at your local retailer or you can simply visit plantstrongfoods.com today. I had a patient suffered cardiac arrest right in my lobby uh, a number of years ago. We resuscitated the patient, we shocked him. Uh, by the time the ambulance got there, the paramedics got there, he was awake and talking, had an IV in, etc. I put him in my hospital, one of my colleagues uh, did his coronary angiogram, they didn't have any significant blockages. We implanted a defibrillator. But while he was in the hospital, he was on a raw detox diet. That should be yeah. the adjunct to the therapy. Mm -hmm. So yes, the technology is needed in many people's cases, but the problem is that we are ignoring the foundation of health. The foundation of health is optimal nutrition. I'm Rip Esselstyn and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plant Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Today, I'm gonna to share with you the story of David and Goliath. Okay, not that story exactly, but a modern day version with today's guest, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. In 1997, Dr. Montgomery opened Montgomery Heart and Wellness in Houston, Texas, right in the shadows of the powerful and world-renowned buildings of the Texas Medical Center. He's a board-certified cardiologist and cardiac entrophysiologist. And throughout the years, he has treated thousands of patients with severe cardiovascular diseases. And here's the thing. Even though he employed state-of-the-art procedures, interventions, ablations, and medications, his patients continued to grow weaker and sicker. He started researching nutrition's role in disease reversal and found that, yes, you guessed it, plants were the common denominator in determining wellness. Today at Montgomery Heart and Wellness, Dr. Montgomery helps patients achieve optimal health and wellness through various nutrition programs. And his goal, to get his patients to think beyond the script in order to improve their health and reverse these chronic lifestyle diseases. I was fortunate enough to grab an hour of his time in between seeing patients to talk about his career, his groundbreaking nutritional methods, and his exciting upcoming events, including an open house at his facility and a new docu-series entitled Heart and Soul of a Champion. So if you hear a little background noise, it's just a busy man at work who took some time to speak with us about the good news about plants. Oh, 
And you'll want to stick around to the very end because after we finished the official recording, I was able to ask him a couple more questions and you don't want to miss his answers. Dr. Baxter Montgomery, thank you so much for coming on the Plant Strong podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I look forward to it. I do too. I do too. So Baxter, I think the last time that you and I crossed paths, if I'm not mistaken, was about 11 years ago. And we Mm -hmm. were in Marshall, Texas. Mm -hmm. We were there for an event that Ed and Amanda Smith were putting on called Get Healthy Marshall. Mm-hmm. Is for people that don't know, it's a little town in in East <laughs> East Texas. <laughs> in East Texas, that's right. That's right. And um, you know, I can remember there was a there was a tote bag that one of the participants had because everybody got some tote bags, and it said, "Only kale can save us now." <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's a great memory. I don't remember that, but that's a that's a great line. <laughs> it is. It is. And you know, and much the way it is in Houston, maybe not so much in Austin, in Marshall, Texas, you know, barbecue and chicken fried rice mm-hmm. are a way of life. And unfortunately, just as our heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and all these chronic Western diseases. And the five-term mayor of Austin, Ed's, I'm sorry, of, of Marshall, Ed Smith, in 2008, he was literally like up against the wall with prostate cancer went on a, you know, very robust whole food plant-based diet and was able to basically shrink down his, his prostate tumor and, uh, you know, started proselytizing and for a number of, number of years held the get, uh, get healthy Marshall, um, uh, event in, in, in Marshall. And anyway, that is where you and I first met. And I think you were speaking on heart disease and everything that you were doing at your incredible uh, clinic, the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center uh, yes. in, in Houston. So I would love to, you know, I've had other cardiologists on on the show. I've had, you know, Columbus Batiste. I've had Kim Williams. I'm sure these are friends of yours. Um, not cardiologists, but Dean Ornish and my father, uh, Brian Aspill. And I, I love gleaning something different from each and every one of you, you, you cardiologists that have kind of taken this, uh, I'll say high road, uh, where really you're seeking prevention as opposed to just the myriad amounts of, you know, pills and procedures that, that are so prominent in that profession. Um, so I'd love, I'd love to know about er, a Baxter, um, kind of your upbringing and why in the world did you decide that you wanted to become a physician? (laughs) Well, um, this is a one hour show, so that's quite a bit to chew on. But here, the, the upbringing part is pretty interesting because it, it reminds me of a question that um, John McDougall asked me years ago is, uh, you know, what contributed, what your background contributed to what you were doing? And, and, and I recall when I was very young, probably seven years old, uh, we were building a house. And, and um, long story short, as a little kid, we were living in an apartment. And my uh, dad said, let's go and see the lot where we're going to build a new house. Uh, and so I just heard new house. We drove out there and we got out of the car and I just saw this uh, lot with weeds. And I got out of the car and said, well, where's the new house? And so it, as a young kid, I saw a lot with weeds uh, develop into a house. My, my parents, they built it cash. We were on general contractors. So the, the point I'm making is that that building of a house uh, was made a big impression on me. Fast forward to where I'm now uh, in my private practice, reflecting back on that, we did things very unconventionally. Building a house was not the conventional way of doing it. People would take out a 30-year mortgage, et cetera. We didn't do it the conventional way. And that has impacted the way I do things now, unconventionally. Mm. And uh, I was you know, trained in the traditional way of medicine, medical school, internship, residency in internal medicine, general cardiology, cardiac electrophysiology, and I started my practice. But in the back of my mind, my mindset was always looking to do things unconventionally, not just for the sake of doing things unconventionally, but always looking outside the box when the things in the box were not working. Right. 
And so when I started seeing patients, and the difference when seeing patients in the private practice compared to seeing patients when uh, I'm in training is that you get a longitudinal perspective of your patients. What I mean by that is when I start seeing Mrs. Jane Smith or Mr. James John Smith, and I see them on day one, and then, you know, year one, year two, year three, I get a perspective in terms of what their health is. And one thing I recognize with my patients is that despite the advancing technology of procedures and, and devices that I learned to implant in patients or prescribe for patients, the patients continue to get sicker. And so that's when I started to look elsewhere outside of the box. Uh, and that led me to plant-based diet as well as other unconventional things that we use in our practice. So <clears throat> I love I love that story about your parents and what they did to build that build their house and they paid cash and they were the uh, they were the general contractors. Where did you grow up? What city? Uh, Houston, born and raised right here. I'm more like one of these oak trees, uh, deeply rooted. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Um, and so, but why the love of medicine? What steered you in that direction? You know, uh, in ninth grade, uh, I was in class and one of my classmates said, hey, I want to be a doctor because they make $90,000. <laughs> and I thought to myself, hey, I'd like to make $90,000. I guess I'll be a doctor too. So I never thought again about it. So that was step one uh, in medical school. I mean, again, I mean, undergrad uh, medical school, I decided that I wanted to uh, be a cardiologist. That was based on some research that I, I was doing between my first and second year medical school. Uh, so that then led to me going into cardiology. Of course, I had to train in internal medicine before that. And during my internal medicine training, I decided I wanted to sub sub specialize in cardiac electrophysiology. And, you know, again, once I set my mind on it, I never looked back. And so that was my path. It wasn't anything early on that was so profound. I enjoyed sciences. I enjoyed interacting with people. And I guess those two things were a natural marriage for medicine. But it wasn't like I said, oh, I want to cure cancer or anything. It was just that, hey, this seems to be a nice thing to do. Uh, it's fascinating. And you know, it involves science and people. So uh, I, I went in that direction. So I think it was more or less a, a God-driven uh, uh, directive, and uh, it's truly my passion today. Yeah. And when did you, so when did you open up your own kind of private practice? Uh, immediately out of training. I never worked for anyone. So I, and that was the other part about that building of the house. You know, um, it, it taught me that uh, I can build things myself. I didn't have to go to anyone else to get a job, et cetera. So really the only job I had was when I was a kid working part-time jobs or I worked in college, I worked in medical school. So I had those jobs during training. But when, when I, you know, got, uh, when I completed my training, I, uh, you know, opened up my practice on day one and uh, never looked back. And so um, it was uh, early on, it was a conventional practice. You know, I was busy as a cardiac electrophysiologist and, and the electrophysiologists, we're actually the consultants of the cardiologists. They send patients to us who have a rhythm problems. And uh, so I was maybe probably the first, one of the first nine electrophysiologists in the Houston in private practice. Uh, it was a very, you know, new field at the time. Uh, and so I was very busy. Uh, I had hospital privileges at probably somewhere between 11 to 15 hospitals scattered mm -hmm. throughout Houston. Uh, and Houston has a very large footprint. For anyone in your audience who hasn't been here, you can drive 50 miles in, from one part of the city and still be in the city limits. Uh, and so it was quite uh, a, a busy practice. I was taking an emergency room call. I'd be up any hour of the day seeing patients, doing corneal angiograms, doing device implants, ablations. Uh, and so that went on for the better part of two decades. Uh, however, in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do something in the area of wellness. I didn't know, know exactly what that meant. So as time progressed, I, as I said, I noticed my patient's health getting worse. I had some episodes, issues with some family members that I work with uh, that, you know, shine the light, uh, shone the light on this whole health issue. But then my health started to decline. My cholesterol went up, my blood pressure went up and the like. And so I started looking outside of the medical literature, you know, I started reading the, the lay press and, you know, you read a lot of things about, you know, this snake oil, you know, potion, et cetera. But the common denominator was a healthy diet and the common denominator of the healthy diet was plant-based foods. And that was one thing that I noticed. And 
uh, out of some strange, for some strange reason, I happened to take this raw vegan uh, chef course. I took a weekend crash course to become a certified raw vegan chef. And in that crash course, I was introduced to plant-based nutrition. Uh, we learned how to make wonderful raw dishes. And I was also introduced to a gentleman named John Rose in Houston. And he was well known for uh, doing detoxes, juice feast detoxes. And so I signed up for his program and did a 33-day raw juice detox. And my life turned around in an amazing way. I felt 18 years old. Now somewhere around I don't know, 39, 40 at the time. Uh, and uh, that introduced me to this world of plant-based nutrition. I not only continued that lifestyle, but I started applying it to patients. And the patients what I- What year is this? What year is this, Baxter? So, oh gosh, this was about, um, I was maybe 39 or 40. So I was 36 in 2000, so 2004, something like that. Uh, 2000, yeah, 2000 was, um, 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 okay. now, so whatever, I'm not going to do the math right now, but around yeah. 2004. So I this, think. so this is before the China study and my father's book and some others. I mean, there was a couple, maybe McDougal's books were out there, but, uh, you yeah. probably hadn't read those or even. No, I hadn't heard of any of those guys. In fact, I didn't hear about them until around 2008. Uh, and and uh, in fact, it was 2008 and 2009, we had a conference here and I invited your father, I invited Essie, I invited uh, Neil Barnard, I invited Dick Gregory and a couple of cardiology friends to speak at a conference. We had been doing conferences since 2006, but our conferences were uh, to primary care medical professionals uh, and a well done conference that we would hold. Uh, but in 2009, we decided to do conferences for the general public. Uh, but anyway, back when I, you know, did the juice feast and started changing my life over and I started applying to patients, what I noticed that, you know, applying this natural food diet to patients had a, an amazing impact on their lives. Uh, these patients, I mean, the patients I see are, they, they range from being in the ICU to barely out of the hospital. The hearts are beating at 10%. They've had bypass, they've had stents, they have devices. And so these were the patients I was managing. So I remember in particular one lady who had an ejection fraction of 10%, the heart normally should beat about 55 or 60%. Hers is beating at 10%. Uh, she um, had had four vessel bypass, three stents since the bypass. She was a diabetic. She was, had arthritis in a wheelchair and on oxygen. When her husband wheeled her into my office, she was on 21 medications. And so, uh, it's not pretty. No, it's not pretty. And she wasn't looking too good. So I looked at the medication list and I thought to myself, well, my goodness, you know, am I going to add medication number 22, 23, 24? And so I asked them one question. I said, do you have a juice? And they said, yes. I said, great. Here's what we're going to do. And I started writing out these juicing recipes. I said, so don't eat for the next 10 days. Do this raw juice detox. And I would call her and check on her and, and we adjust medication over the phone. But she came back in 10 days, walking, talking, no oxygen, feeling great. This is just 10 days. Uh, and I applied this approach, you know, raw plant-based diet, salads, first things. I was writing my own recipes, everything from scratch. Just in, you know, and I would type them up and I built a little booklet. Uh, it was one patient at a time, seven days at a time. Go seven days, come back and see me. Seven, another seven days, come back and see me. Because I knew it was a very aggressive regimen. I couldn't give it to him and say, come back in a month or three months. Yeah, yeah. I say, just do this for seven days. I didn't talk about the rest of their lives. And, and so and, and, back, and, 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 and you'd say, do this for seven days. And how much time would you spend with them? Well, it, it varied, but usually quite a bit of time because, you know, I would go in and talk to them and I have a team approach. I've always had a team approach and even more so now. And so, you know, my mid levels go and do the vitals and I would go and talk to them and I would come out of the room while they're getting their testing done. I would go in and type in some recipes and I'll go back in and talk to them some more. So when patients come to our office and, you know, they spend a little time with us, there's a lot of testing that they do and the like. Uh, and so I tend to spend a fair amount of time in private practice. It's tricky because, you know, because of reimbursement, you know, you don't have that much time, but yeah. we manipulate things here to where the time the patient is spending in a clinic is my time may be interrupted, but I may go and talk to them for a few minutes, 
you know, up front. Uh, I may have a mid-level or MA go and talk to them about something else. And we have handouts now. But at that time, it was very difficult because it was just me. I didn't have a trained staff. Uh, but uh, but I spent the amount of time that was necessary. But the fact that they knew that, one, they were feeling ill. Two, yeah. uh, I was giving them a potential solution. And three, we were going to see them back in seven days. So I didn't have to work too hard to convince them because it's just going to be seven days, at least in their minds. And and that's part of the trick. So they come back in seven days. And they had a rough time, but they, they noticed they're feeling better. They're on fewer medications. Then they said, well, when can I eat? So no, give me another seven days. And I would do that successfully maybe three times in a row. And what, what would happen in that period of time that was not only uh, a clinical improvement in the patient, the physiological and biochemical improvement in the patient, but it was a psychological improvement in the patient. Mm. Because even though I had them on a very, very stringent regimen, extreme uh, by some people's definition, it was extremely effective. And so the patient, on one hand, struggled with the fact that, hey, I'm only eating yeah. lettuce, <laughs> grass and water, if you will, but I'm feeling amazing. And so it was, it was, I was chipping away at their, you know, inability to make lifestyle changes because they had a huge impact with an aggressive change. So then when we come up with a moderation program, I say moderation, meaning that it's 100% plant-based. But then now you can steam your broccoli. Yeah. They're begging to have some bean soup. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So so the aggressive approach helped make the you know a hundred percent plant-based approach seem very easy for them. And then we developed boot camp classes and and um, uh, our patients started wanting to buy the food from us. So we didn't have to uh, open up a restaurant in our building. Now we have a restaurant and grocery store and, and we're getting into growing foods. It's 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 gotten into, you know, as, as John McDougall says, it's the food. And, and that's been the core part of our intervention. Now, we do other things like sauna therapy. We was, we was starting a program called Heart and Soul of a Champion that I'll share with you later, which puts all of it together. And we bring in exercise and the like. But the food, it starts with the nutrition. And the body has to cleanse and heal uh, first and foremost. And, and this is something that we learned uh you know, over two decades ago. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fascinating to me that you were doing this, you know, back, back in the mid two thousands and getting such fantastic results. And, you know, you seem like a guy that, you know, you, you like looking at and reading the, the data and the research in the medical literature. And at that point in time, was there, was there much out there? Did you, did you look, scour the literature or not? You know, there wasn't a lot in scientific, a lot of scientific data. I, I mean, when I started at, you know, again, I was reading, you know, lay books. And so they didn't have, you know, yeah. uh, control, prospective control studies. You know, they were just talking mostly anecdotal and, and also theoretical. Uh, however, my personal experience was the first. I mean, I, so I guess I had a data point of one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that that, you know really yeah. started things out and so and but it, it was so dramatic and then when uh, i started applying to patients and see the thing is that so the, to answer your question no there's no data however uh the empirical evidence i had was patient after patient after patient after patient it was 100 percent. yeah and it wasn't 100 percent mild change it was 100 percent drastic changes now i work in the world's largest medical center. I've been working in the world's largest medical center for 25 years. We have three heart transplant centers in walking distance. There's, you know, there's few places in the world that has a technology equal to or greater than what we have here. So I've seen the best that medicine has to offer. Yeah. The greatest that medicine has to offer from the traditional standpoint. So, and my, my center is just four miles south of that. I refer to them as, 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 um, as uh, Goliath and we're David. Yeah. Uh, and so for me to have the impact on these patients lives who had gone through everything that the world's largest medical center had to offer uh, was uh, uh, very impressionable for me. And not only that, uh, over the years, I've had a number of patients who were too sick to get bypass surgery, too sick to get uh, interventional cardiology procedures. I've had and those patients we've been able to turn around in the hospital with detox, some patients on for hospice with heart failure, we turn around with detox. I had a patient on life support intubated on the ventilator with a 
chronic lung disease and heart disease with the kidneys failing. And she, her family refused dialysis. We put on a detox. She walked out of the hospital. So the impact factor of this intervention is very strong. When we published our data, um, gosh, five, six years ago, we had a group of about 31 patients with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and uh, we applied the intervention with this, this patient group. And we had amazing results in a very short period of time. So for example, um, uh, the hemoglobin A1C was reduced by 3.4% in this population. Now, this is not a population of diabetics. This is a population of people with the selection criteria was hypertension, obesity, and hyperlipidemia. Yeah. So the average hemoglobin A1C was 5.9. So that's just barely in the pre-diabetic range. But we had a 3.4% reduction in just four weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that that's a huge impact with, you know, statistically significant impact. And uh, similarly, we were the first to show a reduction in uh, lipoprotein little a, which is an atherogenic molecule, in just four weeks, 16% reduction, just four weeks. Statin drugs done to affect that. So the impact of this intervention is is, is quite strong. Um, so there's a lot I want to unpack about what you just said here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for, for, for starters, um, I love your analogy with your David and, you know, <laughs> And you got Goliath just a couple miles down the road. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in reading through your website and looking at your goals for, I should say, yeah, your goals and kind of mission as the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center, one of them is contributing to a needed paradigm shift in U.S. healthcare. Yes. And you are absolutely doing that. So huge, huge kudos to you for that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 It's, it's something that we have to... So it, it leads to a current project we're doing. And um, if uh, that's essentially the links, I imagine be in the notes, but we, we currently have a, a program. Uh, it's um, uh, Heart and Souls of a Champion. And for years, we did these boot camp classes. And, and um, your dad used to tease me about boot camp. He said, why do you call it boot camp class? <laughs> it's a military boot camp. But um, it was along the lines of boot camp because uh, it's sort of like two days football boot camp. It's a, an intense uh, uh, training period for a finite period of time to accelerate. In the case of boot camp and two day football, to accelerate your physical fitness. In this case, we're doing an intense nutritional training for a finite period of time to accelerate your nutritional fitness. Yeah. And so we would put people, as I used to say, grass and water for four four weeks, raw fruits and vegetables. And, it, you know, we arbitrarily chose four weeks. It came out of my initial clinical experience. But anyway, in 2009, uh, sometime thereabouts, we did a boot camp and I had some retired NFL players uh, come. And one of the, the, the vice reps was a retired NFL player, a huge guy. And, he, you know, he saw the things we were doing. And he was telling me about how these NFL players, you know, after retirement, or, you know, suffering mm -hmm. chronic illnesses. I said, well, let's go and, you know, bring some and detox them. And so uh, I went to a local chapter meeting. We talked about it. We got some of the guys came and and we actually filmed it. Uh, and um, we had a professional film crew, et cetera. Uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, we didn't get the project finished. You know, the, the platforms then were not available. Uh, mm -hmm. Then were not available then as they are now. But I always thought back about that and I said, look, you know, I want to do this project again. So fast forward to now, I was uh, uh, speaking at a Veg Fest in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, and uh, I was introduced to Daryl Green and and um, some other guys, and I shared with him my desire to do this, and he was really eager to do this. He had you know, the interest in in sort of revitalizing his fitness level, and so uh, we put together Heart and Soul of a Champ, and I'd already started working with some professional athletes. Uh, already. So we had a group to come through. Now, this program is more than just a detox. So we, we put in time restricted eating, the raw diet, plus we have our restaurant now. So we provide all the food. We do infrared sauna therapy and, and other types of therapies uh, and that improves cardiovascular fitness. And then we added exercise. So we started with this group and I brought in a film crew, director from Hollywood. So we put forth Heart and Soul of a Champion. Heart and Soul of a Champion is both a, our elite intervention program now but it's also an art form so we've started the makings of a docuseries and the purpose is to take this intervention 
and put it on different platforms so people see it over and over. So the first uh, season is going to be with athletes. Uh, sus subsequent season will be the next uh, season two will be uh, chronic illness in women. Uh, we're going to have people of all walks of life because uh, everyone is a champion in their own right uh, and they need to revitalize the championship. And so so this is the approach and the, the goal is to take this approach to health and put it before the everyday citizen and normalize it. When people think about eating a 100 percent plant based diet, it seems extreme or weird mm -hmm. uh, when you think about exercising rigorously so the people go and walk them out but exercise the rigor we'll get 85 year old ladies i get people with, with who's had strokes on walkers we get them out of the walker get them out of the wheelchair i'll get an ma on one side we'll have them do lunges right here in the office mm -hmm. and one of the patients 85 she's a cancer survivor you know with diabetes she was doing lunges now she can barely hold herself up and we help balance her but she did about five or six lunges on the follow-up appointment, she was laughing. She said, look, I've been doing these at home against the wall. He said, I've been sleeping much better. Mm -hmm. And so what Heart and Soul of the Champs is going to do is we're going to get people in every walk of life. They come in wheelchairs. They're going to wheelchair to the walker, walk to the cane, cane to the to the level ground. We're going to walk them up the hills and roll them down the hills. But the point is that we're going to take patients of every walk of life and give them the opportunity to get to the next level, whatever that next level is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and one thing we've seen with what we've done so far is that the psychological impact on these patients is just amazing. Uh, and it's it's the old saying, you know, you, you're creating an animal. We want to create animals out of these patients. We want them to be rigorous toward their health and confident that they can get up and move and, and nourish their bodies properly and move their bodies properly. So. Heart and soul of a champion is going to take this process and normalize it. Because when you see someone else on the screen doing it, then you're going to know that I can do it too. Are you, so tell me, your facility there, it, is it a, a facility where you have beds, where people spend, spend the night, or is it just day only, or how does that work? Right now, it's just day only. So we have patients flying from all over the country, and we have um, extended stay facilities that we have. Uh, some relationships with, so we, you know, arrange for them to stay in extended stay uh, places for, say, six weeks. So, um, you know, we get patients out of, you know, New York, East Coast, West Coast, and, you know, everywhere else, and they'll come in and spend some time. Uh, there are a lot of different stories. There was one patient who was uh, in a hospital in North Carolina, some small, well, not too small at the time, in North Carolina, but he's on the heart transplant list. And uh, his, uh, the doctor was telling him he needs an LVAD. And so he looked us up online and he got in touch with my integrated care coordinator and uh, he ordered food from our restaurant because we ship, you know, throughout the, the 48 contiguous states. And so we were shipping to the hospital and then he got out of the hospital and we shipped it to his house. And so people find us by, you know, whatever it means. As another story, a guy was in a Harlem hospital and he looked us up and his car, surgeon was about to go on vacation. He said, well, I'll be on vacation for two weeks. When I get back, I'm going to put an LVAD in you. So he's in the hospital bed looking at his, you know, YouTube on the phone and, you know, look at the work we're doing. And he checked himself out of the hospital and came down to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> what For people for people don't, that don't know, including myself, what's an LVAD? I'm sorry. Uh, LVAD is uh, acronym for left ventricular assist device. So what happens is when, the, the essential part of cardiac function, you have two, four chambers. You have, you know, the two upper chambers, the left and right, and the two lower chambers, the left and right. The left lower chamber, the left ventricle, as we call it, uh, supplies uh, circulation to the body. So that, I mean, all of the ventricles are important, but that's the one that gets most attention because when that one fails, then total body circulation fails and, and um, uh, you get a lot of trouble. So what happens is that when you have heart failure, uh, we're usually referring to the left ventricle. And so when the left ventricle fails, then uh, it needs assistance by whatever it means. And so one uh, surgical approach, uh, short of, of, of transplant, because you know people are not always ready for transplant for the lack of donors most of the time. So they've come up with a mechanical device. Now the full mechanical heart has not panned out technologically, but you can mechanically assist the left ventricle, the left lower chamber. So uh, that's called the left ventricular assist device or the LVAD. 
Got it. Got it. Good. Um, you also mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, in addition to bringing down the, those A1C levels in those 30, 30 something patients, you also were bringing down the uh, lipoprotein A. Um, will you explain to our, our audience what exactly is lipoprotein A and uh, how, how important is it for us to know our lipoprotein A marker? So lipoprotein A, it's a molecule that's very similar to LDL cholesterol molecule, but it, it's an atherogenic moiety. So it, it essentially, it potentiates clot formation. Mm-hmm. So think of it as an LDL-like molecule that potentiates thrombosis or clotting. Yep. Uh, and so if it's elevated, people can have an elevated lipoprotein A and normal cholesterol, quote unquote, uh, total cholesterol, and still uh, be at risk for uh, uh, heart attacks or stroke. Uh, it's probably uh, in part influenced by underlying inflammatory mechanisms, as well as perhaps other mechanisms that we don't understand. But we do know that uh, lowering the lipoprotein little A is helpful. Having said that, um, you know there are a lot of there are many biomarkers that that um, we know that are signs of underlying uh, biochemical and physiological imbalance. However, there are other biomarkers we've yet to discover. And what I like to emphasize with people is to look at the totality of your health uh, as opposed to focus on one or two biomarkers. We know that LDL cholesterol being high is not good. Total cholesterol being high is not good. But these biomarkers are not only, you know, signs or risk factors for heart disease, but in the China study, Colin Campbell found that uh, elevated cholesterol is associated with increased cancer. I mean, elevate, so I, when I see elevated cholesterol, I think of a metabolic imbalance. I think of hepatic metabolic imbalance. And so I look at it from a, from a, in its totality, not just from the standpoint where you got too much cholesterol in your blood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, so you're a member of the, the, the fellow of the American college of cardiologists. Yes. Um, I, 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 I'm really, I'm dying to know. So in 2022, with so much information now showing what a kind of a whole food plant-based lifestyle can do to help mitigate heart disease. Do you find that your colleagues are getting on board with this or are they resistant? (laughs) You know, um, it's, I don't know if I'm allowed to say on this platform, but anyway, um, it's, Here's the thing. I think you can say whatever you want on this platform. <laughs> yes. Here's the thing. The um, my colleagues whom I respect greatly, and 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 uh, and many of my colleagues uh, who I work with locally, you know, they're wonderful people. I have a lot of patients. You know, I still work at uh, a hospital here in the medical center. I have patients there. I have patients get procedures. They have things they have to have done. Uh, so everyone's not able to you know, make uh, the kind of changes that they need to make to turn things around. So patients need hospitalizations and the like. Uh, but my colleagues, I don't think are are equipped enough mm-hmm. to be able to make those changes. I, I think that's probably the best way to say it. And by that, I mean the following. Um, you know, medical school training is not just a training. I mean, you, that's one level you have uh, education is up here. And that's your, your, your thought, you're taught to think, or your, 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 you know, you're, you're taught to debate and, and look at data and analyze and, and come up with a conclusion based on empiric data, et cetera. Then there's a training where you, you know, are given skills, et cetera. But then there's a, a lower level than training, which is indoctrination. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, what we call medical training is more of an indoctrination than an education or even a training. And when one has been indoctrinated, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's an impediment toward your looking outside of what the indoctrination yeah. has led you, the direction the indoctrination led you to. So unfortunately, too many of my colleagues are not equipped, despite how you know uh, how a level they are in academia. And, and, I, and I'm not, I don't say there's a criticism, I have all due respect. There's, they're very bright people in many regards, 
Uh, and, and there's a lot of benefit to medical technology because a lot of people need it uh, yeah. because of the, the status of our health condition and lifestyle condition. But unfortunately, uh, they only apply that and not apply the lifestyle. So for example, let's take someone who is very ill, who has a very weak heart, they're in the hospital, uh, and they need, uh, maybe they need valve surgery, or maybe they need, you know, bypass, or maybe they have a left vein and the heart is weak and there's some benefit, or maybe they're having a heart attack. Let's use that. So they're going into a heart attack, a cardiac arrest. Well, they will go and resuscitate the patient, do the medical procedures, et cetera, and, you know, put them on a standard American diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a patient suffered cardiac arrest right in my lobby uh, a number of years ago. We resuscitated the patient. We shocked him. Uh, by the time the ambulance got there, the paramedics got there, he was awake and talking, had an IV in, et cetera. I put him in my hospital, one of my colleagues, uh, that is coronary angiogram. They didn't have any significant blockages. We implanted a defibrillator. But while he was in the hospital, he was on a raw detox diet. That should be yeah. the adjunct to the therapy. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the technology is needed in many people's cases, but the problem is that we are ignoring the foundation of health. The foundation of health is optimal nutrition. So I have a, a, a saying First and foremost, optimal nutrition. And you can probably modify that statement to optimal lifestyle because mm -hmm. exercise and proper sleep goes in there. But let's say optimal nutrition. Next is nutraceuticals as needed. Last is pharmaceuticals as a last resort. Mm -hmm. So optimal lifestyle, nutraceuticals as needed, and pharmaceuticals and medical therapies as a last resort that should be our attitude but unfortunately we have that upside down when you say nutraceuticals what exactly does that mean that would be vitamins minerals i mean mm -hmm. lots of people need a b12 you might need in some cases vitamin c i use coenzyme q10 for some of my heart failure patients yep. so these are isolated uh super nutritical uh, uh magnesium for instance so these are isolated nutrients. Uh, they're not foods, but they're isolated nutrients that have been shown to have some benefit as an adjunct for people who have advanced health issues. Mm -hmm. are, do, are you are you friends or do you know Eric Adams at all? Yes, uh, Eric Adams. I'm uh, I'm quoted in his book, and we're going to invite him to our gala uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, October. Uh, we hope to have him and Rip Esselstyn sitting in our gala. We're going to send you an invitation pretty soon. <laughs> hey. uh, I, we're just now getting, we just launched our site and we're just now sending out an uh, invitation. But I, I text him and his assistant and she's going to get it before him. But yeah, it, we had lunch together, uh, gosh, back in 2019 and um, uh, pretty impressive life story he has. And, oh, very and, much. Um, yeah, he and uh, he knows my aunt, who's a retired New York State senator. Uh, and so they had worked together uh, up there for years. But, yeah, a very, very, very nice man, down to earth man. Yeah. Well, you brought up how the first, um, you know, people after they have heart surgery, right, they should go on the detox or some sort of a more of a whole food plant based diet instead of burgers and fries. And I think he's initiated a something in new york state where the hospital is there the you know the default diet that you get in bed is a heart healthy whole food plant-based diet I, I believe wow i love that i love here i need to, to check on the details that i love to have yeah. him come and talk to us about that that's yeah. great yeah that's yeah and 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 there's also uh, at uh montefiore hospital um, with, uh, I don't know if you know, Dr. Robert Osfeld. Rob Osfeld. I know Osfeld. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he's, he's been doing good work up there. He, very similar work there. Wonderful stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, you mentioned that you're seeing people coming back in seven days with these staggering results. I mean, explain, explain to our, the listener, how can the human body get that healthy in that short a period of time? That almost seems impossible. <laughs> yeah. You know, the human body, you know, the, I think it's Psalms 137, whereas you're fearfully and wonderfully made somewhere thereabouts. The human body is an amazing, an amazing uh, 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 
design. Mm -hmm. the, the miracle isn't that the body gets better in seven days on a raw plant-based diet. That's not the miracle. The miracle is that the body can tolerate all the <laughs> atrocious foods and terrible lifestyle and terrible things we do to it for not only seven days, but decades. That's the miracle. The miracle is that all these people are walking and talking. You talk to them, so well, I eat trash all the time. I drink too much and I smoke. And you know, you're 30, 40, 50 years old. That's the miracle. I see people walk in the office and, and you know, they're talking, they're sick, but they're still talking and breathing. So, wow, that's a miracle. <laughs> I mean, seven days of raw plant based diet and getting better, that's nothing. I mean, just think if somebody's choking you and they've got the arm, you got a, a noose around you, and somebody's choking you blue in the face, and that's for decades. And all of a sudden, somebody cuts the rope out and you start breathing. So, whoa, what a miracle. So, no, that's not the miracle. The miracle is you've been choked for. for 30 years, you're still walking. <laughs> People are literally physiologically and biochemically choking themselves with the bad food they're eating, the lack of fresh air, lack of sunshine, lack of exercise, poor sleep, all that's a manifestation of what they're putting in their bodies. But but to, to, to answer your question more directly is the following. Yeah. Uh, biochemically, when we're putting in these bad nutrients in our system, we uh, these abnormal molecules uh, we refer to as uh, uh, free radicals, uh, creates an imbalance of free radicals to antioxidants. So you have what's called oxidative stress. It's oxidative stress, um, to give you an analogy, if you, you know, bite into an apple and sit it on the counter, you see it turn uh, brown and oxidizes. Uh, the apple is exposed to oxidative stress, and so you see it deteriorate and wither away after several days. The human body does a similar thing at the biochemical level. This happens at the cellular level. The other component that's interrelated with oxidative stress is increased inflammation. Uh, again, these bad foods, the dead animal flesh, the carcass, I mean, you, you're putting in your system, uh, you develop increased inflammation intracellularly uh, between inside the cells, between the cells, uh, inside the tissue, and the body is slowly deteriorating. When you, you do two things when you go on a plant-based diet, particularly a raw plant-based diet, there are two things that happen, more than two things, but the two fundamental things. One, you're removing the insult, okay? When you stop eating bad food, and that's the first, and I tell people the first, the, the, the first step to optimal nutrition has to do with what you don't eat as opposed to what you do eat. Mm. So the absolute total removal of the bad food is the first and formal step to optimal nutrition. So you're removing that, so that's a big impact. And then the next thing is you're replacing it with optimal nutrition, foods that bring energy, that bring life, they alkalinize the blood, they mm -hmm. essentially put out the fire. These foods are loaded with antioxidants that stabilizes these uh, free radicals. So you're reducing oxidative stress, you're reducing and eliminating inflammation, and the body's coming back to life. And this happens in a matter of, minutes hours days to weeks so you're it is it, it is such an absolute beautiful thing so I, I i think it's fair to say then you're not a fan of moderation that's correct your dad said it right moderation kills but you know it not only kills but it tortures so let's say for instance if i were an evil person <laughs> and you come to me and you say look dr montgomery i'm, I'm you know i eat fried chicken three times a day, seven days a week. I love fried chicken and my cholesterol is up, my blood pressure is up and, you know, I need to do something with my lifestyle. I say, okay, wonderful. I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's get off the fried chicken for, you know, six days a week. And, and one day of the week on Sunday, you have all the fried chicken you want. Okay, great. Six days a week, you, you know, you're suffering, you want fried chicken, you can't have it, you're getting better, blood pressure getting better. On day seven, great, I'm having fried chicken. Well, the fried chicken on day seven is going to destroy all the benefits of the first days one through six. Mm. That's number one. It'll destroy most, if not all. That's one. Wow. Two, yeah. it's going to reinforce your addiction to fried chicken. And so after that day seven, day one comes back around, you can't have fried chicken. You're suffering day one through six until day seven comes again. So I'm basically only feeding into that addiction, making life worse than what it was. At least when you're eating fried chicken every day, you're feeding the addiction. At least you were getting some pseudo satisfaction. Now I'm torturing you while at the same time impeding your improvement. Yeah. So moderation uh, is sort of have you running in quicksand. You, you're, you're running, but you're going nowhere. You When you go all the way, yes, it's difficult at first, maybe the first day, the first week, the first month. 
But while you're going through that struggle, you're making progress. That's number one. Number two, you're getting rid of your addiction to whatever these bad foods are. Because with the, I tell my patients, look, your issue is not heart disease or high blood pressure or diabetes or, 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 or stroke. Your issue is your addiction to bad food. Mm. I need to cure your addiction to bad food. Once I cure your addiction to bad food, then the diabetes, the high blood pressure, those things just naturally go away. Yeah, that's a great explanation for it too. And how do you, how do the vast majority of your patients respond when you deliver that message to them? You know, they, they're very receptive to it. And what, what we've learned over the years is that um, when the person has their mind made up, then they're ready to go. Mm-hmm. And so it's our role is to help them get to a point of renewing their mind. Uh, I saw a patient the other day, uh, unfortunately, has an autoimmune disease and, you know, she had some issues and I've been seeing over the years and, and, you know, she's gotten to a point she can't walk anymore. And so and I've been coaching her. But, you know, I saw the other day, she said, look, you know, I'm, I'm not at a point where I'm ready to go all the way. You know, I just mm-hmm. want to take baby steps. And it was, it was very sad because she is going all the way, just all the way in the wrong direction. You see, the thing is that what people don't understand is that you, you will make a lifestyle change. It's going to be on your terms or on the disease state's terms. Mm-hmm. But you're going to make a lifestyle change. And if you're if you're in your mind not able to make those changes toward improving your health, then you're left to make those changes to deterioration of your health. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of wisdom there. A lot of a lot of years you dealing with uh, different patients. Um, tell me, tell me, tell me this. Um, I, you've said several times this detox system that you have, the, you know, juicing, raw foods. You know, I I am you know personally a huge fan of a of a combination of raw and and cooked. So, are you not a fan of cooked? So it's not about being not a fan of cooked or not. I mean, cooked foods have uh, uh, they're they're delicious. What, what what we found is that, and, and again, the patients I see are really, I mean, when you have somebody who's uh, on hospice and she's, her heart is very weak, she's on this yeah. medication drip that's keeping her together. And when you turn it off, she's going to die. And you got seven days to get it turned around. You've got to hit it with the best. And so these people I see with the best. We know when, when one says cooked, that there's a broad spectrum of cooked. And we know that, you know, deep frying and 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 that type of thing is not ideal cooking. Mm-hmm. So then if you go from the uh, extreme cook part to steaming, okay, steaming's okay. But then you say, okay, when you say steaming, for how long? Eight hours? That's not okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, how about seven hours? That's not okay. How about one hour? Eh, probably too long still. Five minutes, two minutes. So there's a spectrum, you know, even within cook that you say, well, we got to draw the line somewhere. So number one, when people are allowed to cook, it it I don't know where they're drawing the line. And and, and there's a lot of psychology here. So someone I say, okay, you get a whole food plant based diet, you know, et cetera, steam, boil. Okay, great. That a restaurant, they say, okay, give me the vegan option. Well, the restaurant may put oil in it. They may not think about that. So that's that's a that's more of a political thing, but it's it's so that's that part of it. But there is scientific evidence showing that even cooked foods uh, and cooked in mild ways can trigger inflammation. Mm, mm-hmm, mm. That's one. Two, we haven't formally studied it, but in our clinical experience, when I have like especially my patient with heart failure, advanced heart failure, my patient with uh, uh, advanced systemic inflammatory conditions, I will start them out on a 30-day raw diet. They'll get better. And when I put them on a cooked plant-based diet, they start to regress. And we've seen that before. We haven't had time to formally study it, but we have a pretty strong clinical you know, experience that shows that uh, patients need to be on, uh, depending on how systemic their illness is, et cetera, would benefit from a raw diet for a long time. An example, the, a patient I saw who uh, was a gentleman had a history of aortic aneurysm and dissection probably about six, seven years ago, uh, was operated on then. 
Fast forward to recently, mm -hmm. uh, he presented to the hospital with chest pain, was found to have a heart attack, and also had another dissection. Now, dissection, for your audience to know, is where the inner lining of the blood vessel separates. Mm -hmm. And so instead of blood going through the natural lumen of the, the vessel, it can go through the walls and tear the wall apart of the vessel. Mm -hmm. His wall was being torn apart from the aortic arch all the way down to the kidneys. He had a dissection. They call it, I think it's a type A debakey. But anyway, and this normally would be operated on. However, it came in the setting of a heart attack. And so the surgeon cannot operate on it because that's the most dangerous surgery to do in the most dangerous setting to do it in, in the setting of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So they just observed him, stabilized him, discharged him. They came right to our center. They had seen us online. And I put him on a raw diet 100% for about a year and a half. And we just now allowed him to eat a little bit of steamed veggies maybe a meal or two a week. Uh, and that was only after you. I mean, he's, I mean, his wife is cooking some of the most delicious gourmet raw. He's got stuff from yeah. us, et cetera. But the point I'm making is simply this. There are situations where you want to make sure that the patient's getting the absolute best. I cannot afford to have him go and eat something that's steam or have a little oil or whatever the case is. That's one, two. Yeah. Even if it's steam without the oil, I've seen lots of patients with advanced disease on a whole food plant-based diet, no oil, no salt, very regimented, cooking their food and it's only after we put them on raw that they turn around huh, we said it over and over and over and over and over again yeah yeah that's really fascinating what now how do you eat uh, i've been for the last two years 100 percent raw uh i was mostly raw much of my time when i got on this regimen let's say 18 years ago i went vegan then i went from the spectrum of junk food vegan to raw and every year i'd do a raw juice feast and i felt different i said well there's something different in the spectrum of this food so it was about five years of that nonsense. I started pushing more raw, and I finally got to the point where I'm eating all raw. Yeah. Our restaurant does a lot of gourmet raw stuff. And just so that your audience will understand, you know, if you're on a 100% raw diet, there are a lot of things that you can make that's very delicious. For instance, we have a delicious raw meatloaf, sprouted rice with a raw vegan gravy that will knock your socks off. Yeah. We have a raw enchilada pie. We have raw, you know, pecan. so there are a lot of things that you can do in the gourmet raw area that gives you the satisfaction and savoriness of whole foods that you normally would get from cooked. And so when people, when I say raw, people think just, you know, salads and, you know, maybe yeah. wraps here or there, but there's a lot that you can do. There's, you know, some work and effort you have to put into it, but there's a lot that you can do. Yeah. Well, when it, you know, when, <laughs> when your life's at stake here, yeah, it makes sense. What did you have for breakfast today? Oh, gosh. So uh, I had uh, two green drinks uh, and I had some raw granola and uh, some sprouted wild rice. And normally I'll have like um, a salad by this time, but I was between patients and getting ready for this uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> event. So, but yeah. So you have a chef on your on your team, Chef Chef India. Is she still with you? Well, so Chef India, we brought her in as a guest chef. She's not on our team uh, okay. full time. So we brought her in. Uh, she's in, in um, Belize. And so we brought, we contract with her. She came in and worked with us on our, our menu. So she'll bring in, uh, come in. And and, and so I, I uh, worked with her. And, and Chef India is incredible. I mean, she's raw. You know, a lot of these raw chefs, they use, you know, too many cashew nuts and Yep. You know, too much oil and all that stuff. When she came in, I said, okay, we want nothing with oil. We we go, we like, we prefer seeds over nuts in our recipes. So a lot of our recipes are, are not with the cashews and things. We don't use uh, peanuts. So our meatloaf uh, has walnuts and, and um, pumpkin seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll use other hemp seeds for other things. But but yeah, we use Caesar, so she's able to uh, follow our strict criteria, uh, and 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 she's done a great job. We have a quiche uh, salad uh, with broccoli, kale, uh, and there's a pumpkin seed sauce. We have an enchilada pie, as I mentioned. Uh, we have a number of wraps. We we made a raw naan that we use uh, as a pizza crust, uh, and we have a, a pizza that's off the chain. Uh, it, it's it's very very good food. You know, next, you're not too far from using. You need to come down and try our stuff. In fact, when you come to the 
<laughs> to the uh, event uh, when we've seen the invitation. Hopefully, you'll find time. Uh, we'll we'll show you the site, and uh, I think you I think you're gonna have a great time. Uh, tell me, so tell me about this event that's coming up. So the event, uh, if your 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 audience goes to events.montgomeryheart.com, it's a it's a four day uh, open house and red carpet gala. Um, day one is going to be October nineteenth, uh, and we will ha- start with an open house. People will be able, will be able to, to tour our facility. Uh, we'll also be open for consultations. Now these aren't the traditional health consultations where we you know come up with a diagnosis and treatment. But we'll talk to people about their health goals and their health journey and challenges and uh, discuss ways that one of our programs can help them out. We have uh, online coaching. We have an online community. Um, you know, we have, you know, meal plans, grocery plans. We ship. People can pick up, deliver. And, and we give guidance. Uh, so we help people with in, in many different ways with many different support tools. So the consultation program will help you uh, understand how, you know, in what way we can probably help you. Uh, on day two, on October 20th, uh, I'll be leading a group on shopping rounds. We'll go to a local health food shopping store and, and we'll talk about reading labels and, and making wise decisions in the supermarket. Even some of the healthiest supermarkets can be landmines. Uh, and then we'll go on a nature walk. Uh, you know, the Houston Arbor Reading is a great place. And we try to encourage our patients, you know, when I talk to them about exercise, I emphasize exercising outdoors, getting outdoors, going on nature walks. And so we're going to have a nature walk. I'll be leading the pack with some of my uh, uh, assistants and going doing that. Uh, on day three is going to be the evening of the red carpet uh, gala. Uh, it's going to be an evening time starting at five. It's going to be quite a long event. Uh, we'll have the uh, keynote speakers be Dr. Pam Popper, Dr. Kim Williams. Uh, we're going to have uh, David Carter, the 300-pound vegan, yeah, yeah. and uh, John Sally will be there speaking. Uh, we'll have a panel. Uh, I'll go out on the limb and say Rip Esselstyn is going to be there in the audience, so uh, greeting people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but, but it's going to be a great event, and uh, we will. It will be the premiere of our docu series. We'll show the. Um, uh, we will show the um, str- uh, trailer and episode one of season one. Mm. Uh, and then we'll have a, a discussion of that. Also, Wednesday evening on the 19th, we'll have a, a sneak preview uh, of the uh, docu series, uh, and then uh, we'll have the premiere, formal premiere, on that Friday. And then Saturday morning will be uh, a brunch, a celebrity uh, uh, send off brunch. Will be again at our facility, uh, and we'll be showcasing a lot of the food that we prepare in our uh, kitchen. Uh, in fact, you know our Gala is being held at the Rice University Faculty Club, and mm. uh, they have a rule that they have to prepare the food, and we have to meet with them uh, because you know they they prepare vegan food, but you know it has oil and you know whatever's in it. So I met with them, my chef, my kitchen manager, and two of my chefs, my kitchen manager, myself. We went met, we went through the details of how everything was prepared. Uh, we gave them some of our recipes, looked at their recipes made. So we went to, and we met for over an hour, hour and maybe 20 minutes, yeah. going over the intricate details of how everything was to be prepared. Because we said, look, we have a strict criteria and this has to be met. And then they did a great job. They stepped up to the plate. We toured the kitchen. Uh, but I said that to say this again, you know, we, there, there's a very precise approach to this. So as a physician, you know, as I said, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist, and and we we place catheters on electrical pathways that I cannot be off by a millimeter. I have to be very precise when I put that catheter. I have to map out that electrical pathway. I, it has to be with a, a millimeter of precision. If I go in the wrong direction, you may need a pacemaker or have some other problem. So I have to apply that level of precision in my electrophysiology career. Guess what? I have to be very precise when I prescribe a food diet. Mm-hmm. and a lifestyle. We have to be precise. What kind of exercise do you do? We have to be precise about lifestyle prescriptions as we are precise in medical and surgical prescriptions. Well, you know what? what's incredible to me uh, in spending the last hour with you, uh, Baxter, is how your passion for everything you're doing is it's just gaining momentum. It's not like waning whatsoever. Uh, and, and why do you think that is? I mean, you got, you, you, I mean, you're, 
you're going as hard as you've ever gone. You're introducing all kinds of new modalities. You're doing galas. You're doing a docu series. Uh, what's that all about? You know, it's interesting, and, and it's a great question. I, I like that question because it's um, it's uh, it's um, the long and short is this. I recall uh, looking at a um, interview with um, Jeff Bezos. And he said something quite interesting. He said, um, you know, if you have a job that's great, uh, if you have a career that's even better, uh, if you have a passion that's supreme, that's even much better. And, and he, the way he said, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but um, he says, your passion finds you. Uh, and 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 when he says your passion finds you, it's almost a, a biblical aspect of that because as a scripture in the Bible it says, you know, delight in the Lord and and uh, He'll give you the desires of your heart. And and it's not the the sinful desires that He'll give you, but He will put impart, impart desires in your heart that are godly desires, and He will in essence give you your passion. And so it's the passion. It's a, I see it as a God-given passion that's driving me. It's a force that's greater than I am that is giving me what I need in terms of, 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 of getting me to where I need to be. So uh, it's a God-given passion uh, that I see that's, that's empowering me. It's a force greater than me that's mm -hmm. empowering me uh, to do the things that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the best explanation that I have. Well, I, I, I'm a fan. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And, you know, um, I, I listened to an interview that you did probably a couple of years back with uh, Terry Mason. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful human being. And, uh, and he, at the end of the interview, he thanked you for being such a, a, a pioneering, um, you know, not only physician, but also just human being. And, and I, I want to say the same thing. Thank wow. you for for all the incredible pioneering work that you're doing and continuing to do. Um, and I'm a fan, huge fan. And I just can't appreciate you enough for coming on the, the plant strong podcast and sharing your passion and what you've created in your life and your world and all the people you're helping. Um, thanks so much. Well, no, thank you. Thank you, Rip. And thank you for the work you're doing. I mean, again, it's, you know, I consider you one of the pioneers. I mean, you're, I mean, again, the work you're doing and sort of putting this at another level, not only with your podcast, but all the things you've done in the past. So it's a joy to be a partner with you in this whole mission. I mean, it's, this is kind of, this is a heavy lift that we're all trying to, 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 to carry out. And so I, I, I really enjoy uh, uh, and have comfort in knowing that I've guys like you there. So I really appreciate that as well. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hey, can I get a little uh, plant strong? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. I could have talked to you for another four hours. I want to know about vitamin C and thermal imaging and, you know, your take on AFib. I find more people these days that are having AFib issues, you know, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, what's going on with that? And Yeah, AFib is a systemic illness. And, uh, you know, I, uh, as an electrophysiologist, I used to do AFib ablations. You know, that's, a, it's a very, it's one of the more, well, it was one of the more challenging position, uh, procedures to do. Uh, it's still a fairly complex procedure. You have to do a double transeptal, and you have to poke two holes in the heart from the right side to the left. And then you have to map out the pulmonary veins. You isolate the pulmonary veins with electrical catheter, so you burn a ring around the pulmonary veins. Now, the old ways they were doing it, back when I was doing it, they would just stop burning inside the pulmonary veins. So now you used to call it pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary vein stenosis. Yeah. Then we started burning outside the pulmonary vein, just right around the osseum of it. <clears throat> and so that would is electrically isolate the, the pulmonary vein. So the theory is that there's some electrical signals that come from inside the pulmonary vein that goes into the atrium to uh, irritate it, and that triggers a fit. Uh, but that's not the only thing, because what happens is that you have uh, degeneration of the atrium. So with, with inflammation and increased oxidative stress, uh, you develop, it's sort of like potholes in the street. Yeah. So like you're driving in the street, you see a large pothole, you, you try to detour around the pothole. Well, electrical signals do the same thing. Mm. So if it sees a piece of scar patch, it'll detour around the scar patch. But when you detour, when you go around it, 
an electrical signal can it goes around but then it can circle so you can go up this way you go around but then you can go around in a circle well that's called re-entry and so if you go here then here then you go like here and then that's a re-entry and it'll take over the electrical circuit so just think you have like a thousand of these little pothole scar patches yeah. and you got signals going and just doing this and that creates atrial fibrillation now there's a spectrum of atrial arrhythmias you go atrial tachycardia multifocal atrial tachycardia etc yeah. yeah and so a lot of these people that have atrial fib don't have atrial fib that originate from the pulmonary veins they have atrial fib due to uh, uh, uh electrical distortion in the atrial tissue itself well how do you treat that well i just said inflammation and scarring so if you do things like to reduce oxygen stress reduce inflammation you put the body in in physiological balance the autonomic nervous system balance yeah our patches are suppressed etc and you can probably quieten down these and we have anecdotal evidence showing that atrial fibrillation is reduced with a raw detox diet wow wow what about pvcs Similarly, PVCs, yeah. but again, oftentimes people have electrolyte abnormalities, mm -hmm. magnesium deficiencies and things like that will contribute to PVCs. But again, you can have irritable foci, you can have electrical abnormalities. Again, if someone has scarring in the heart due to a heart attack, then that's what we call an electrical arrhythmogenic substrate. So you have a scar that disrupts the normal electrical signal. So that electrical signal has to make a distorted move around that scar and that's a distortion. So one loop is a PVC, uh, infinitely many loops is VT. Mm -hmm. And so so you you have that situation where you have to stabilize that electrical pathway. So yeah, we implant devices to shock the heart, but we also have to nourish the body to erase some of the scarring, to, to suppress some of the scarring and stabilize the electrical signal. Mm. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, really, really, uh, well, Hey, I, I don't want to be a hog with your time. <laughs> I know you yeah, got yeah. patience out there. Uh, and, um, but Hey, uh, thanks for this. And I'm seriously, I, I know we'll be seeing each other soon. The Montgomery heart and wellness open house gala and premiere of heart and soul of a champion takes place over four action packed days from October 19th to the 22nd. 2022. To learn more about this event, visit events.montgomeryheart.com. And I was thrilled to know that Montgomery Heart offers tons of online classes and resources. Plus, they ship their delicious food and meals across the country. Of course, I'll be sure to put a link to this and all other resources in the show notes at planstrongpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and as always, keep it plant strong. The Plant Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.